everyone and welcome back to day three of the Sea Arthritis event here at the ABN booth at the CRA and AHPA annual scientific meeting in Victoria. I'm very excited to be starting off the morning with Dr. Amanda Steinman. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So we were wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself and how you're involved in rheumatology. Sure. So I'm, I'm a rheumatologist in Toronto. I practice at Mount Sinai Hospital and I see all sorts of rheumatology patients. So I practice general rheumatology. I have a niche area of uh, lupus and especially lupus uh, in, in transition, so transitioning from pediatric to adult mm. care. Right. Um, I, my, my academic role is a clinician quality and innovation, which means all sorts of things to, to different people. And so uh, my area of focus there is really looking at models of care that can improve delivery of care to patients that we see with uh, complex rheumatic diseases. Right, great. Well, we're going to hear more about that later on, so I'd love to hear about that. But to begin with, um, you participated in the great debate last night. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, very exciting. Um, and so you argued against the idea that it's better to underdiagnose than overdiagnose. Can you talk to us about those two parts? Sure. So, you know, it's a tricky question in rheumatology mm -hmm. because overdiagnosis is actually taken from the oncology literature when. It, it's really more about um, tests that are used to screen diagnosing things that may not ever become a clinical issue. Right. Whereas in rheumatology, you know, underdiagnosis or overdiagnosis is on the basis of symptoms which may or may not be attributable mm -hmm. to a rheumatic disease. And so the premise was a little bit tricky to start, but I think at the end of the day, it was about checking our own cognitive biases as clinicians, you know, and whether or not we tend to be more on the side of underdiagnosis or overdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly to be sure, we all want to get the diagnosis right 100% of the time, right. but at the end of the day, we just need to be mindful about whether we are erring more towards overdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. And so I think it really opened up a really robust and interesting discussion with a little bit of irreverence along the way. Okay, so I was wondering, just to clarify, is there an example you could give for what would be an underdiagnosis and what would be an overdiagnosis? Sure. So, so we ended up landing on lupus a lot because okay. lupus is so nebulous and it mm -hmm. can look so many different ways in different patients, and so that's why it's called the disease of a thousand faces. Right. Although, you know, this this is same is true for many of the rheumatic diseases that we see that you know they, they present atypically, and so the thing that kept coming up time and time again last night was a rash and ANA positivity okay. in and someone ANA who's got positivity. some fatigue. Yes. So, you know, you have the antibody there, and the antibody is not at all specific. In other words, it can be seen um, in patients who are in entirely well or with other disorders mm -hmm. that are not rheumatologic. Um, and then rashes, of course, are nonspecific. Mm -hmm. Rashes can come from so many reasons, and yet the combination of ANA positivity and rash together makes you start to think about lupus. And so right. an overdiagnoser may say, well, you know, this could, this could be lupus. Mm -hmm. Someone who's underdiagnosing could say, you know, this, this may be rosacea and an incidental ANA finding. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that the, that the balanced approach is somewhere in the middle, um, and I think we need to see how patients evolve. Right. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So I wasn't able to make it to the great debate last night myself, but what was sort of, um, was there a consensus? Was there, was it just that? Oh, yeah, we it? won. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome, great. Um, no, so, so I, I mean, I think that, I think that both sides really wanted to drive home the message that it's more important to be thoughtful and exhaustive in your in your approach to to thinking about patients mm -hmm. and i think regardless of which way you're looking at things um, i think that that really is our our mandate and our goal and our duty as physicians um but but to to just be mindful of where we fall on that spectrum right okay well that sounds great that makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> perfect um so how do you think um, underdiagnosing then could impact patient outcomes? Sure, so I mean that could result in misdiagnosis and of course the, the signs and symptoms in rheumatic diseases or otherwise can range from very, very mild to very severe. Mm -hmm. And of course you don't want to be missing any of these mm -hmm. and certainly at the extreme end of the spectrum it could be very dangerous. Um, and at the, at the um, less severe end of the spectrum it could delay diagnosis increase uh, time with symptoms and so right. forth and you know in in any way it can be it can be harmful potentially yeah absolutely and when you know permanent damage might be a possibility like it is in many rheumatic diseases right. it's important to 
uh, get the right treatment at the right time. Absolutely. Um, you know, and we're coming from a time when, you know, for decades and decades, we didn't have much by way of option to mm -hmm. treat. You know, so under diagnosis or, or, you know, more importantly, under treatment was really the rule for lack of alternatives. Right. And now we're in this era where not only, not only are we more aware of rheumatic diseases, but we have more treatments to offer. And so how does that... How does that impact on our sort of cognitive, mm. um, uh, you know, approach to approach disease management? Right, absolutely. So now I'm hoping we can um, switch a bit into the area to learn about um, your role as a clinician in quality and innovation. So you're involved in certain quality improvement initiatives, as you were saying, related to delivery of care. And I would love to hear about what some of those initiatives are. Sure. So, so. Uh, one thing that I've been working on for the past several years that I'm very excited about is called Project Echo. Okay. And Project Echo Rheumatology is a way to um, expand rheumatologic care to mm -hmm. increase capacity in our system, which as we all know is stressed, is overburdened, mm -hmm. there aren't enough rheumatologists, there, are, there isn't enough um, to really go around, and so we want to be able to provide care to everybody in a way that's equitable, that's appropriate, um, where there's access to all. And so what we do is we have weekly video conference events, and these are with primary care providers from across the province of Ontario. Wow. And so they log on, one of them presents a case, and that's really the crown jewel of Project Echo, and it's a one-to-many ratio. It's so, so we all learn, we all teach. Mm -hmm. And so we all learn from each other, and the primary care providers who are logged on discuss this rheumatologic case. Right. And in doing that, and in using real-world examples, um, they really get a chance to to improve their rheumatologic acumen mm -hmm. where there is support. So we have a hub team of rheumatologists and physiotherapists and ACPAC trained practitioners and pharmacists and so forth. Um, and so so we you know we, we work with primary care to really to build a community of practice to increase rheumatology knowledge right. um, in primary care. And so it's been it's been a really exciting initiative. We've all learned so much from it, and we're excited mm -hmm. to keep it to keep it moving forward. Yeah, great, no, that sounds so important. And when you say primary care, um, I'm assuming you know that includes like family doctors, general practitioners, where you do that first line of Absolutely. contact. So, oh, that's, that's wonderful Absolutely, family doctors, nurse practitioners, even mm -hmm. physiotherapists, chiropractors, right. anybody who may see patients who present with rheumatic diseases. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so what can, um, with your work in quality of care and models of care, um, what can healthcare professionals do to improve the delivery of care to patients? What can patients do to receive to ensure that they're receiving that proper model of care? I think at the end of the day, you know, it's a really, really good question. I think at the end of the day, it comes to good old fashioned listening and communicating. Right. You know, and I think that it's a two way street. I think we need to we need to listen as physicians. We need mm -hmm. to we need to hear what you're saying. We need to share our thoughts and and you know, provide you with the best possible information mm -hmm. that we have in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, as patients, I think similarly, I think it's it's all about sharing how you're feeling, what you're thinking, mm -hmm. being transparent and and open, and being able to have that dialogue um, with your with your physician. And so I, I think that you know, in spite of all the advancements in technology and everything, at the end of the day, it's really old fashioned. It's about good old fashioned talking. Yeah, absolutely. That human connection between absolutely. Healthcare provider and patient, absolutely. And I'd be curious to know, um, so with Project Echo, you're uh, trying to, as you said, increase the knowledge of rheumatology and for um, primary uh, care providers. Uh, let's say we hear this quite often from patients that they feel that they're having these symptoms, but their um, you know, family doctor uh, doesn't, doesn't really see those symptoms as being what the patient thinks, and maybe they're struggling to get a referral to a rheumatologist. I know this is a tough question, but um, do you have any sort of um, insight or advice in that area? You know, it's it's it is a tough question. You know, um, and I I can empathize with what patients go through and sympathize in some ways. You know, I think we've all been there in in some in some part of our life, and mm -hmm. so I I really think that it's it's about self advocacy. I think it's about speaking up, and if you say something once and perhaps it's heard differently, maybe say it a different way, say it again, right. ask for a second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I think that these are all avenues that can be um, worthwhile. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that I think that as doctors, we're also 
open to hearing and learning from patients, mm -hmm. you know, and so if there's something that I'm missing, I would certainly want to hear as mm -hmm. well. And so, so it's about knowledge exchange. Yeah, absolutely. I like that self advocacy and knowledge exchange for sure. So now, um, this, the theme of this year's meeting is 2020 vision, a new decade in rheumatology. What does that mean to you? Where do you hope to see rheumatology in the next decade? So, so, you know, it's, it's been really exciting. Um, it's been a great meeting and I find that the one theme that has really um, strung through the entire meeting for me has been collaboration. Right. So it's been collaboration between specialties. You know, we had a fantastic talk about the microbiome and the gut. Mm -hmm. We had a fantastic talk about interstitial lung disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, interdisciplinary collaboration, certainly. Then we had our meetings and there was so much collaboration between pediatrics and adults, oh, between AHPA, you know, and the allied health professionals mm -hmm. and rheumatologists. So there's tons of collaboration there and finally collaborations with patients. Right. And, and so I think that as high tech as we come, you know, I, I may seem I may seem a throwback. It may seem like I'm very old fashioned, but at the end of the day I really think that, that collaboration mm -hmm. and building those bridges, which is actually last year's theme, right. but still <laughs> germane this year. I think it's really the most important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it seems like that's what you're doing through um, Project Echo and those initiatives, as well as uh, you mentioned at the beginning when you were introducing yourself, uh, your role um, or specialty in that transition from pediatric care to adult care. Mm -hmm. um, what are the challenges in that area, that transition period? Oh my goodness, there are so many. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that as an adult, as an adult rheumatologist, you know, we see patients from 18 to 118. Wow. And so what we need to realize uh, collectively and individually is that that transition period is such a unique and intense period, not because of the disease itself, and it doesn't matter if the patient has lupus or JIA or you know virtually any other disease, it's that superimposed on such a formative mm -hmm. and important time in developing one's own identity. Yes. <laughs> and it's really the interplay between between that and chronic disease that makes mm -hmm. it so challenging and so unique. And so I think that having um, knowledge and a skill set and best practices mm -hmm. at that time, and this is something that's come up in the meetings and come up in committee meetings as well, um, is, is really critical. And I think raising awareness among um, adult providers certainly right. um, is going to be really critical. And it's, it's, it's a challenge, it's worthwhile, um, and it's, it's a very satisfying part of, of being a rheumatologist. Right, absolutely, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. We're wondering now if there's any questions from our viewers, Anita? We have a question that's um, saying, what would be the possible checklist of quality indicators? So what are the signs that patients feel that they're underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed? Hmm. So that's a good question. Um, so, so from what I gather, you're wondering um, about quality indicators in underdiagnosis? Or just quality of indicators of care in general. Right. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of excellent work being done within, within the CRA and, you know, across, across the globe, really. Um, about quality indicators for various diseases. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a little bit disease specific. Um, you know, there, there can be things as simple as, you know, making sure that, uh, simple and complex in some ways, as making sure, you know, flu vaccines are obtained annually for patients who, um, who are on immunosuppressive mm. therapy or have inflammatory disease. Um, you know, being seen within a certain period of time for, you know, for, 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 certain, for certain conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or for spinal arthropathies. Um, so I, I think that the question is hard for me to answer and I'm floundering a little bit because there are so many different ways that we can go with that. And so if, if there's an opportunity for a clarifying question, I'm happy to try to drill down a little bit further. Or perhaps a checklist of what patients should like expect from their care. Um, I, I think that I think that patients should leave feeling like there's been an exchange mm -hmm. of knowledge. You know, I, I think that it's important to be able to feel like you've been heard, mm -hmm. that you're able to learn, that you're able to listen, and that, you, that there's been um, a successful transfer of knowledge, of ideas, of communication, um, and that you come away with it with a little bit more security or understanding or a plan mm -hmm. than you came in. I think that at the end of the day, regardless of what condition you have, 
I think that that's a goal. Right, absolutely. So it sounds like, you know, maybe more than um, instead of having, you know, these specific things need to be followed, maybe it's more about how the patient feels after the interaction, how they feel about their own care. You know, and so even to summarize your own care at the end and to say, you know, so what I've, what I've gathered from this is we, you know, is that I may have this and that we're going to do X, Y, and Z about that. Is that is that what's happened here? Mm -hmm. You know, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I think that that can be a really valuable tool. Oh, absolutely. That summary at the end of mm -hmm. every meeting with a healthcare provider. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simon. And um, <clears throat> we're wishing you all the best with the rest of your time at the conference. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Mm, of course.